so we talked about these microscopic wormholes, which you know, my mind is still blown away by that. But if we talk about a little bit more seriously about wormholes in general, also called the Einstein Rosen bridges, to what degree do you think they're actually possible as a thing to study, creeping towards the possibility, maybe centuries from now, of engineering ways of using them, of creating wormholes and using them for transportation of human-like organisms? I think wormholes are a perfectly valid construction to consider. They're just, they're just a curve in space-time. Um, the topologically, which has to do with the connectedness of the space, is a little tricky because we know that Einstein's description is completely in terms of local curves and distortions, expansion, contraction, but it doesn't say anything about the global connectedness of the space. Because he knew that it could be globally connected on the largest scales. This kind of origami that we're talking about, that you could travel in a straight line through the universe, leave our galaxy behind, watch the Virgo cluster drift behind us and travel in a straight line as possible and find ourselves coming back again to the Virgo cluster and eventually the Milky Way and eventually the Earth, that we could find ourselves on a connected compact space-time. And so topologically, um, there's something we know for sure, something beyond Einstein's theory that has to explain that to us. Now, wormholes are a little funky because they're topological. You know, they create these handles and holes in these sneaky, by topological, I mean these connected spaces. And Yeah, it's like Swiss cheese or like something. Like Swiss cheese, and they, right. And they, so I could have, you know, I, I could have two like flat sheets that are connected by a wormhole, but then wrap around on the largest scale, you know, all this c cool stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong with it as far as I can see. There's nothing abusive towards the laws about a wormhole, but we can reverse engineer. We were saying, oh, look, if I know how matter and energy are distributed, I can predict how space-time is curved. I can reverse engineer. I can say, I want to build a curved space-time like a wormhole. What matter and energy do I need to do that? It's a simple process, and it's the kind of thing Kip Thorne uh, worked on, very imaginative, creative person. Um, and the problem was that he said, oh, you know, here's the bummer. <laughs> the matter and energy you need doesn't seem to be like anything we've ever seen before. It has to have like negative energy. And that's that's not great. <laughs> um, there are some conjectures that we shouldn't allow things that have that kind of a property that have negative energies. Uh, only things that have positive energies are going to be stable and long lived. But we actually know of quantum examples of negative energy. So it's not that crazy. There's something called the Casimir effect. You have two metal plates and put them really close together. You can see this kind of quantum fluctuation between the plates. It's called a Casimir energy. And, and that can have a negative energy. It can actually um, cause the plates to attract or repel depending on how they're configured. And, and so you could kind of imagine doing something like that, like having wormholes propped up by these kinds of quantum energies. And people have thought of imaginative configurations to try to keep them propped up. Is it? Are we at the point of me saying, oh, this is an engineering problem? <laughs> I'm not saying that quite yet, but it's certainly plausible. Yeah, so you have to get a lot of this kind of weird matter. You need a lot of this weird matter to send a person through. Right. Uh, that's gonna be really telling. I'm, so I, I'm not saying we're, it's simply an engineering problem, but it's all within the realm of plausible physics, I think. I, I think that's super interesting. And I think it's obviously intricately and deeply connected to black holes. Mm -hmm. is, is it fair to think of wormholes as just two black holes that are connected somehow? Is that People have looked at that. They tend to be non-traversable wormholes. They're, right. they're not trying to prop them open. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of this ER equals EPR quantum entanglement, they're trying to connect black holes. Um, you know, it's it's really cool. It's not quite, again, it's not quite following the chalk. And by that, I mean, we can't yeah. exactly start at a concrete place, calculate all the way to the end yet. So if, if I may read off some of the ideas that Kip Thorne has had about how to artificially construct wormholes. So the first method involves quantum mechanics and the concept of quantum foam. And this is the thing we've been talking about. Now, to create a wormhole, these tiny wormholes would need to be enlarged and stabilized 
to be useful for travel, but the exact method of doing this remains entirely theoretical. No shit, you think yeah. so? <laughs> so this, the, these tiny wormholes that are basically um, for the quantum entanglement of the particles mm -hmm. somehow enlarged. Man, playing with the topology of the Swiss cheese <laughs> yeah. would be so interesting. Even to get a hint, mm -hmm. that would be like top three, if not one of the, maybe even number one question for me to ask. If I got a, a chance to ask an omniscient being, omniscient being of like a question they can get an answer to, mm -hmm. maybe with some visualization, mm -hmm. like the shape, the topology of the universe. Mm. Yeah. Like but like, I need some details. Right. Unfortunately, I'll get an answer that I right. can't possibly comprehend. <laughs> right. It's a hyperbolic manifold that's identified it's across. Just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, gonna... need, you need to be able to ask a follow-up question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that would be so interesting. Anyway, um, classical and quantum strategy. The second approach combines classical physics with quantum effects. This method would, this method would require an advanced civilization to manipulate quantum gravity effects in ways we don't yet understand. There's a lot of... In ways we don't understand. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of... <laughs> and then there's exotic matter requirements. There's a lot of... But I can tell you, stabilization. I, I'm pretty sure all of them have in common the feature that they're saying, here's what I want my wormhole to look like first. So it's like saying, I want to build a building first. So they are... They have, they construct, there's an architecture of the space-time that they're after. And then they reverse the Einstein equations to say, what must matter and energy? Uh, what are the conditions that I impose on matter and energy to build this architecture? Which is unfortunately a very early step of figuring out Right, thing. but it's important because it's how they realized, oh, wow, they have to have these negative energies. They have to violate certain... Uh, energy conditions that we often assume are true. And then you either say, oh, well, then all bets are off, they'll never exist. Or you uh, look a little harder and you say, well, I can violate that energy condition without it being that big a deal. <laughs> and um, and again, quantum mechanics often does violate those energy conditions. So do you think the studying of black holes and some of the topics we've been talking about will allow us to travel faster than the speed of light or travel close to the speed of light or do some kind of really innovative breakthroughs on the propulsion technology we use for traveling in space. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I assign in an advanced general relativity class the assignment of inventing a warp drive. Warp drive. <laughs> and it's kind of similar. So the idea is, uh, here's a place you want to get to <laughs> and can you contract the space time between you with some... So the kind of some, something antithetical to dark energy, the opposite, and skip across and then push it back out again. <laughs> That's all. Can You can do that in the context of general relativity. Now, I, I can't find the energy that has these properties, but I also can't find dark energy. So, so we've already been confronted with something that we look at the space time. The space time is expanding ever faster. We say, what could possibly do that? We don't know what it is, but I can tell you about its pressure. I can tell you certain features about it. And I just call it dark energy, but I actually have no idea. It's just, that name's just a proxy for what this, it should be called invisible because it's not actually dark. If it's in this room, it's not hard to see through. It's not dark, it's, it's literally invisible. Um, so maybe that was a misnomer. But the point being, I still don't fundamentally know what it is. That's not so terrible. That's, that's the state of the world that we're actually in. So maybe warp drive is just kind of like a version of that. I, I don't know what form of matter can do that yet, but at least I can identify the features that are needed 